Another thrilling event occurred recently that also involved a legendary vessel, this time a real ship named the Titanic. When it embarked on its maiden voyage, it was deemed not only the finest luxury liner in the world, but virtually unsinkable. No other maritime occurrence has excited the imagination or the curiosity of scientists and writers alike more than the tragic circumstances that detailed the first and last voyage of the great ship Titanic in April of 1912. For more than 70 years, salvage experts and oceanographers had attempted first to locate the position of the Titanic, known to be some two miles beneath the surface, and then to determine if it was at all reachable and salvageable. It wasn't until the summer of this past year that anyone was able to pinpoint the location and actually see the ship, which had rammed an iceberg in the North Atlantic and taken the lives of over 1,500 people. The man responsible for heading that expedition is Dr. Robert Ballard. And with his ship, the Nor, he did the impossible. He found the Titanic. Dr. Ballard is one of the members of the advisory board of the Living Seas Pavilion, and his rendezvous with the Titanic seems to be only a baby step in his plan to walk the floor of the seas in the future. The true story of how he found the ship is more fascinating than any novelist could dream of, and tonight he's with us from San Diego, California, from the Melville, the sister ship of the Nor, where he embarks later today on a three-week expedition off the Mexican coast. Tonight, though, he's got some pictures of the Titanic never before seen on television. Uh, Dr. Ballard? Yeah. John Ritter. Hi, how are you, John? Fine, looks like you're getting ready to go out again. Yeah, we're trying to get the vehicle ready. We uh, sail in a few hours, so uh, we're trying to get the last minute preparations completed. How long has finding the Titanic been a dream of yours? It took 10 years of planning. Uh, it's something that I've been uh, wanting to do for many, many years. In, in underwater exploration, the Titanic was uh, a Mount Everest, something that uh, was going to happen, and I wanted to be the one that was a, a part of that happening. It was really three years of intense preparations when we knew we were going to go, and then two months of actual at-sea uh, effort uh, during the weather window. Even though it was supposed to be the nicest time of year, we still got the dickens knocked out of us. Uh, we had a major hurricane go through. We had gales, 40-knot winds, but we had enough time that we could persevere and Mother Nature uh, finally yielded up the, the Titanic after a hard-fought battle. You know, we've all read about your adventure with the Titanic and the technology you used to find it. Obviously, we're here looking at an example of that technology now. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, Argo is the uh, uh, latest in a new generation of underwater exploration vehicles. Uh, for many years, we've been using uh, manned submarines. And the problem with going down to the ocean floor in a submarine is if you get inside the submarine, and you drop towards the ocean floor, and it takes you about two to two and a half hours to reach the average depth. Well, the whole concept of this new technology is what we call telepresence, projecting your soul and spirit to the bottom of the ocean, but leaving your gallbladder, your kidneys, and everything else behind. And Argo is the vehicle that carries our mind and our spirit to the ocean bottom using a series of the very advanced underwater cameras. Could you show us how it works? Well. Inside the frame of Argo are three cameras. They're very, very sensitive cameras. They have an ASA of about 200,000, which means the camera can almost see in the dark. Argo's primary job is to use its low-light level TV images to find things. But once we find it, like we found the Titanic, then we want to go down and take some really close-in color pictures. Right behind the TV camera is a color camera. And when we come up, we take that film and we bring it into this lab. Come on in, we'll look at it. In the, in the lab, uh, after the lowering's over with, uh, and we have the color film, particularly like when we ran over the bow of the Titanic, uh, we give it to uh, uh, Martin here, and Martin loads it up into the auto processor, and then we process it, and uh, several hours later, we bring it out, and we can project it, and you saw the pretty pictures we took. Once we get uh, Argo in the water, and we lower it down uh, 10 to 20,000 feet, the center activity shifts from the deck into the control van, which is the real heart and soul of the system. So let's go in and take a look at it. Now, this control center is obviously like the one you were in when you first saw your pictures from the Titanic. What did you feel like when you finally saw them? Well, we were like kids at Disneyland, is what we were like. And uh, it was really one of the most exciting moments of my life. Uh, we didn't immediately uh, 
go over the top of the Titanic. We were a little scared of it, actually. We didn't know how it was sitting on the bottom. And uh, we were standing right here uh, when we made our first run, looking at that monitor. And we came in on the port side around the number one funnel. And initially, we were looking at out into fuzz, like you'd look into a, uh, a fog and, and with your high beam. And then all of a sudden, the side of the ship came into place. And uh, you could hear a pin drop. Uh, when uh, we went over the ship, and it was one of the most exciting moments of my life, that's for sure. You didn't have much time left, did you? No, we were on a short fuse. Uh, we'd been looking for the Titanic for two months on the French ship Le Sorois, one uh, 20 some days, and then we shifted over to the uh, to the sister ship of this ship, the Nor, uh, and uh, we're almost out of time then. We're down to four days left uh, of a 10 year dream, and uh, it worked out, fortunately. Well, what kind of a feeling did you get for the passengers? Well, you know, there were images that we saw coming up on the television that would just grab you. Images of uh, empty lifeboat davits. Uh, images of where John Jacob Astor stood when the funnel hit him. Uh, images where the people were loading onto the lifeboat. Uh, all sorts of images that would just grab you. Uh, pictures of bed springs, chamber pots. Uh, personal items that people had, and it, it brought the disaster back to you, and uh, you constantly relived it through those four days. What were the first clues that you got to what actually happened that night? Well, when we were doing our search, uh, we were chugging away over land, uh, over hill and dale, so to speak, over what was really much like a, a snow-covered alpine slope. And we came across the, the, the debris from the ship. In fact, the first real image that we could, could really recognize was uh, one of the boilers. And uh, we then turned and, and found uh, the debris continued up to the north, and that's where the ship was sitting proper, due north of the boiler that we first found. Well, tell us about more of the things that we're looking at now, could you? Our initial images uh, were done with the television system of the debris area. And then after we got enough nerve up, uh, we took the television across the ship itself and made a series of passes over the superstructure of the ship. Uh, we went over the uh, number one funnel that had fallen open. We went over the opening to the grand staircase where the first class passengers came in. We did a lot of passes over the bow, over the chains, over the forecastle. We nearly missed the mast. Uh, we almost hit it. And then after we finally got familiar with the ship, uh, we decided to lower a good old Angus down because we'd have to go in even much closer. Because Angus' job was once Argo had taken the television images, Angus's job was then to go in for the beautiful close-up color still pictures. And that was the most dangerous part of the whole trip because we had to get so close. 13,000 feet of water. We had at times uh, strong seas and winds. We had to lower this vehicle down 13,000 feet and then drive along the contour of the ship at an altitude of about 20 feet. And uh, that isn't very easy. Now, there's a controversy about going down to ships like the Titanic and salvaging them. What are your feelings about that? Well, to me, the Titanic is a gravesite. Uh, it's like the Arizona in Pearl Harbor. It uh, should be treated as a memorial. And I understand Congress has just passed a bill to protect the Titanic uh, from uh, senseless salvaging operations by Americans. I hope that other countries, certainly France and England, Canada, will do likewise to preserve that ship uh, from people who will tear it apart. Like I said, we have begun to find the pyramids of the deep that have been placed there by uh, human activity. And the question is, are we now going to revisit those pyramids to plunder them or to appreciate them. Well, you found the Titanic, Bob, but I got to ask you one other thing. Is Daryl Hannah down there? Well, you know, I didn't get into all the compartments. Uh, my hope is we can get back and go into some of those first class uh, staterooms and you never know.